thought initially that I'd be in Daniel, but the Lord has changed my 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 direction, my heart, my mind as I came in through from this morning into tonight. And uh, Hebrews chapter one. I just want to take some encouragement here from from the very first chapter, uh, verses one down through seven in your Bibles. Hebrews chapter one, verses one through seven. It says, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners or many different manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by His Son, whom He hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also He made the worlds, being, who being the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person, and upholding all things by the word of His power, when He had by Himself purged our sins and sat down on the right hand of God, of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance, hath by... What is it? Is it not on? Uh -uh. It says it's on. You interrupt him. <laughs> That's okay. Technical error sometimes. Okay, all right. All these mics going on, but let me let me just start back over here, okay? Uh, I'll start in verse 3. Who being the brightness of His glory and express image of His person and upholding all things by the word of His power, when He had by Himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels, as He had by an inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they, for unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, And let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels he said, saith, Who maketh his angels spirits, and his ministers a flame of fire? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray you would just help us, Lord, with all this technology and advancements in this world. Lord, I pray you would just give me guidance to concentrate on your word. Lord, I pray that you would just give me calmness of spirit and, and, and of mind. Lord, I pray you give me the Holy Spirit to help direct my speech and my thoughts. Lord, I pray that everything said and done tonight be glorifying to you. I pray you keep me from saying anything that might be contrary to the word of God. Lord, that everything that would be pleasing in your sight. Lord, bring comfort, bring help. Bring direction, discernment uh, to the people of God as they listen in. Lord, you know what you, you desire to accomplish as you direct me here in this passage. And I pray you use it for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Uh, this, tonight I'll preach to you a message that I've entitled, God has spoken. And of course, if God has said anything, that's what we need to pay attention to, right? Amen. God has spoken. Uh, as Alexander the Great was setting out on his conquest of Asia, and of course we know Alexander the Great is a man who has set out to conquer all the known worlds, he inquired uh, during this time as he's beginning to, to set out to conquer Asia, he inquired of the finances of all those who would be following him, his soldiers and, and his, of, his, of his captains of the armies and so forth, of what, how they're doing and of what their needs might be. He wanted to ensure that they're not troubled by what's going on back home. And, and, and they wanted their mind to be set and focused there into the battle and that they might be able to conquer the, 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 the armies, the other armies that they're up against. And so to ensure that this would be the case, he, uh, he inquired, and because he knew that there would be some needs, uh, he just started distributing some of the royal resources and revenues to, to those who might need them. He began to distribute much of the resources. Again, you know, there probably wasn't a whole lot left over by the time he got done doing that. And uh, when he had disposed of nearly all the resources, he, he, he asked his friend, uh, General Perdiccas, uh, he asked him, he asked Alexander the Great, he says, uh, well, sir, Alexander the Great, the king, I don't know how he addressed him, but he asked him, he says, uh, what have you reserved for yourself, being that you've distributed out much of the resources of the royal, uh, royal empire? He says, the only thing that I reserve for myself is hope. The only thing that I kept back for myself is hope. And of course, he wasn't looking for the resources of the world. He was looking to conquer the world. 
And in, in, in that case, Perdiccas said, he says, we who share in your labors will also take part in your hopes. And they refused to take uh, that, that which Alexander the Great had allotted to him and to those of his fellow friends as well. Many of them also gave back of what Alexander the Great had given to them. And he said, because you're relying upon hope, that's what we're going to rely upon. And we have a greater hope than what Alexander the Great was relying upon. We have the hope of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And my question for you tonight and for, for all those who are listening in, what are you basing your hope upon? Is it hope in the world? Is it hope upon religion? Is it hope upon what you're going to get? What is your hope uh, that you're basing everything upon in your life in times of crisis, in times of storms? Uh, because life is uncertain in many, many different aspects. But one thing is certain, we, we have certainty in Christ. We know that we can rest our salvation sure as it can be in Christ and His shed blood there on the cross. The book of Hebrews was written uh, to an obvious Jewish audience. Uh, again, that's what the title of the book is called, the book of the Hebrews. And so here he's writing to those at a time frame between 64 and 68 A.D. of uh, that's what many many take to be the time frame of the writing of the book. Again, we're, we're not certain, uh, many are not certain of who has written the book. I'm convinced that it's the Apostle Paul. But be, being that this is a, a book that's not given a certain author, uh, God knows, the Holy Spirit being the author, but it was written between 64 and 68 A.D., at a time of much persecution and trouble that's going on in in, in the hearts of these uh, Jewish Christians who had given their lives to, to serve the Lord and start churches and to go on uh, for the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But when persecution began, began to hit, they began to tuck tail and run and turn in apostate, uh, in apostasy and turn back to the old Jewish ways under the old Jewish system. And uh, there is a warning here within the book of Hebrews to those who, have, in the face of persecution, have turned back. If you've ever studied the persecution of the Emperor Nero, who had leveled against uh, Christianity here, if you have ever studied the persecution that he laid against the Christians, you would understand that it wasn't a pleasant thing. It was a definitely a hardship, and you wouldn't blame them if you knew what he, they were up against during that time frame. But the writer of the Hebrews draws us a comparison between the old Jewish system and the, the system of Christianity. It begins to look at the, the, the old system that was under the Mosaic law, and he compares that to what you have in Christ. He looks and he says, he says, well, I know under the old system, I know that uh, Christ, He's much better than the angels. I know Christ is much better than the law. I know Christ is much better than Moses. I know Christ is better than the high priest. Christ is better than Melchizedek. Christ is better than the sacrifices. Christ is better than the tabernacle. Christ is better than anything that the Jewish system ever had to offer. And this is what God has pointed our hearts and our minds to. If you want to be have anything in this world, it's not to turn back into the old Jewish system. It's not to turn back into the old sacrifices. God has made one sacrifice of which He set up to be the one and only sacrifice once and for all times with us to put our faith and hope and trust in. You don't need to turn back into the old system because it's not going to take away the uh, a sin-cursed conscience. It's not going to cleanse your conscience. It's not going to do anything for you. This is the sacrifice that you're to lay your hope and your faith and your trust in. The key word here found in the book of Hebrews is the same found in the book of Ecclesiastes as we just uh, read through there not too long ago, came together through as a church. And the key word in the book of Ecclesiastes was better. Better. The same goes through the book of Hebrews. Christ is better. He's better than the angels and everything that I have just described to you a little bit ago. They're reminded that under the Old Testament and the formal dispensation of the law, that apostasy was uh, put under a terrible, terrible punishment. They would be divorced from God and from the covenants of God, put out from the tabernacle, put out from the people of God, and uh, there was a terrible price to pay for that. With that uh, reminder, they would be given the encouragement to continue on in the grace of God. Hey, if you think it was bad under the Old Testament system, uh, what makes you think it's going to be any better if you want to apostate from Christ? If you want to turn from Christ to go back under the old system? I looked there in the book of Galatians where Paul, he had marveled that they, the, ch children, or the children there, or the chief 
the church there in Galatia was so soon removed. You remember the words of Paul. He says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from the simplicity that it be in Christ. Who hath bewitched you? Who hath turned you away into Judaism? Well, the same thing is going on here. They're reminded uh, that they have so much better that's offered in the person of Christ. And so don't look back uh, and see what the world has to offer. Don't look for the comfortable route. You would just put your faith and trust and continue on with the person of Christ. He'll Let Him be your Savior. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. And this is the, the whole message for tonight. That you must not move from your standing in Christ. You must not move from your standing in Christ. Again, if you don't get anything else out of the message for tonight, I know that there's many in the world who, who've gone and as soon as things get tough, they want to go in the way that's, uh, that's easy for them. They want the easy way of worship. They want the easy way of compromise. They want it, when, when things are going bad, they want what feels good and instead of continuing on with Christ. And I believe that they'll be ha having a more terrible price to pay uh, for making that decision. But we must continue on and stand, make a stand for Christ. It doesn't matter if it's good or bad. Job says, you know, shall we not receive uh, not only good from the Lord, but also the evil. And if Job had that mindset, I know that we can too. And so I want you to look, first of all, at God's approval here. The writer of the Hebrews, uh, I like the fact of the matter that he doesn't waste any time. You know, there's a lot of us, we, you know, you get into a conversation, they want to take you all the way around the bush, and then they finally get to asking you what they really want to ask you. Here, the writer of the Hebrews, he starts out with the very first word, uh, a very direct and a very pointed, a very purposeful, a very urgent appeal. It's God. is the whole focus of everything that He wants to get across to us. Hey, if you want to see... The greatest thing that we can lay our hope to, if you're, if you're looking for a reason to follow Jesus Christ, you don't need to look any further than God. He's given His approval. And I believe this is what He's trying to get across here to us. I don't think that you can start out in an epistle, a text, a commentary, or anything else any better than to proclaim the God of the Bible. We get to kind of the same feel of Genesis 1, verse 1. Uh, chapter 1, where it says, In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God. The supreme person, the power of which, uh, for which we're all here, He is the divine Theos, that who fixed the world in place. He's the only sovereign, wise God to whom every man is answerable. He appointed a day in which He will judge the world in righteousness, and He's appointed a person in which He's going to judge the world, and that person is Jesus Christ. And do you want to know why you should keep believing in Christ? It's because the same God in whom you say that you worship and you give assent to, He's the one who gives the approval to Jesus Christ. He says, I didn't, I didn't give approval to the, the fathers. I didn't give approval to the prophets. I didn't give approval to any of these. These are not the ones who's going to save you. Religion's not going to save you. People's not going to save you. A person's not going to save you. The only person who's going to save you is Jesus Christ. There's no other way except for through the Son. And if you deny the Son, you've denied the Father. And I want you to notice a concession is made. He, he, of course, makes a concession. He says, Who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. For the Jew, there was no one better than the fathers. Right? For them, he said, We're, we're children of Abraham. We're his his offspring. We, we have a hope of salvation on account of being His children. God says, wait, hold up, wait a minute. You're to be children of faith, not children of a physical lineage. Hey, you're all born into sin. There's none righteous, no, not one. But they're looking for to be children of Abraham. They think that they're A-OK. -okay. They go and not only Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant and that sign of circumcision that He gives them, but through the fathers and the prophets, they have the Mosaic Law. And so they decided they want to keep the law in order to get to God. Hey, we find that in the law that we're all shortcoming. We're all come short of the glory of God. They go not only from the Abrahamic Covenant to the Mosaic Law, but then they move on from the fathers and the prophets onto the Davidic Covenant. They said there's, there's going to be one who's going to be like David. That's the, the Davidic Covenant in 2 Samuel 7, I believe that it is. 
And they, they were great men, and they were mightily used of God. I'll give you that. And they served their purpose, just like Acts 13, 36, where it says that David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, he fell on his sleep, he died, and he was laid unto his fathers. And guess what? He saw corruption. And so Abraham's not going to save you. He's dead in a grave. Moses is not going to save you. He's dead in the grave. His faith was in Jesus Christ. Abraham's faith was in God who's going to come, Jesus Christ, when he was standing there on the mount. When God asked him to give up his only, begotten, his only son there on Mount Moriah, his faith was that God would raise his own son, Jesus Christ, from the dead for his sins. You get what I'm saying there? And so not only the... the Abraham and Moses put their faith in God, and David put his faith in God. So why are we trying to go back and say, well, I want to go serve the old system? Of those who've passed on and gone on, and, and though the promises were given to these guys, and God has definitely spoke by them, there's no doubt about it, but this is not where we're supposed to put our faith and trust. These were all to reveal God's purpose and bring them unto the Messiah to show them the Christ who is to come. And this is the whole... Uh, purpose of all of it. For them to reveal the Messiah who would come and, and suffer and die in their place for every one of them that they might be saved. And they were all pointing to the Christ that should come. And so if you're cast your hope in somebody, though David might be a great king and though Abraham might be a great father, father of many nations, these guys can't save anyone but Jesus Christ can. And that's why we pray in Jesus' name. That's why we trust in His Word. That's why we Ask Him, we, whenever, whenever we ask anything, we ask it in His name. Lord, save me. Lord, help me. Lord, provide for me. We don't say, David save me. Abraham save me. Abraham help me. No, it's in Jesus' name. It's in His Word that we do things. So, we've lifted up people as great men in this world, haven't we? I mean, we're looking everywhere that we can for, for somebody to find an answer, to, to no matter what it is. Whether it's an answer to the, your family problems, whether it's an answer to the world's problems, it doesn't matter what it is. Many times it's the first thing that we do, we make a mistake and go in to look for man for answers, and the answer is not in man, it's in Christ. But let me ask you, whose approval are you seeking? And what have they done for you lately? God has laid His hand in approval upon the Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter how bad that it gets. It doesn't matter how good that it gets. It doesn't matter what's going on. God hasn't changed His mind. There's no other way to be saved. We move on from that to the fact, uh, He says, I'm not going to seek a feel-good Christianity because times are hard. I'm not going to give up my faith when life is hard and then turn back to Christ when life gets easier. If He's good enough to save my wretched soul, and then He's good enough to keep me, right? So I move away from the, this concession that's made and onto the confirmation that's appointed. Uh, it says, He hath in these last days spoken unto us by His Son, whom He hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also He made the worlds. These last days are in reference to the end of the law and the prophets. There's no more sacrifices to be made. The veil has been rent from top to the bottom. The way into God is, is made open. That, that rending of the veil, that is, is flesh, as the book of Hebrews would say. There's nothing more to look for. There's no more prophets to, to prophesy. There's no more sacrifices to be made. Everything that we need is in Christ. And you remember from the text that I read this morning, Jesus said that the words that I speak are the words of my Father. They're the words of my Father. And Jesus has spoken unto us, and God's re uh, words are revealed unto us by Jesus Christ. It reveals God's revealed will, will is not to seek another Messiah, it's, it's to believe on His Son, Jesus Christ. You remember God's approval at the Lord's baptism and also on the Mount of Transfiguration. What were those words there? He said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I well please hear ye Him. He didn't say that of the angels. He didn't say that of Moses. He didn't say that of the sacrifice. He didn't say that. He says, Jesus Christ, this is my beloved Son in whom I well pleased. He didn't say, hear Moses. He said, hear ye Him. And so there's no doubt. We don't have to doubt about what God approves of or what He's thinking of. It's all in Him. 
And so what business do we have to turn for, to anybody else for help or for encouragement? We, we don't need more religion is what I'm trying to say. We don't need more of men's intellect and men's ability. We need God is what we need. And so some people are so heavily minded. I've heard this said. Some people are so heavily minded they're no earthly good. But I tell you the majority of the folks here are so earthly minded they can't see heaven. They can't get a hold of heaven. I mean, they don't even know which way is heaven because they're still looking to establish themselves in religion. And uh, they doubt and they give in to every wind of doctrine and they, they try to follow this person and that person, this church and that church. I mean, they're looking for, for the greatest pastor, the next greatest sermon, whatever the case may be. Don't look any further. Just stay in the Word of God. These guys are unstable and if they're saved, they're but babes in Christ. Uh, and I believe that. That's why... In the book of Hebrews, we find out that, again, I believe it's the Apostle Paul. It might be in the book of Corinthians, it might be. But it says when you, you guys are keep on desiring milk, you're still feeding on milk. You're still on the, the, the lower thing, still wondering about baptism. It's in Hebrews. Still wondering about baptism, still questioning salvation, still questioning baptism, still questioning uh, those things that you got that at the same time that you were saved, you should have... I'll just stop there, okay? But you should have been teachers of the law. You, you should be growing, you should be desiring meat, strong meat. But you're not. We need to stop belly aching about our problems and take the advice of Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. If you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God, set your affection on things above and not on things on the earth. Why? For you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. Now, I'm not being critical, I'm not being callous. But you know what? We can't live our whole lives in fear. You know, I know that there's, again, there's certain things that you ought to fear, but we can't live our whole lives in fear. Some people are so fearful that they're not coming out of their house. They don't know how to live. They don't know what to do with themselves. I don't know what you've been doing during this time, Sarah and I and the kids. We've been going out and walking around the track to get some fresh air. you got to do something. You can't live your whole life in fear, is what I'm saying. The Bible says He hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of what? Of power, and of love, and of a sound mind. And don't turn back from God, but turn to God. God gives us direct approval of Jesus. He's been appointed heir of all things. And an heir is what? He's the one who inherits all things. He has, the one has power. He has authority. Everything's been given unto Him. The possessions, the power, all of it has been given to Him by the will of the Father. It's not that, just like in the, the prodigal son, the father wasn't dead, was he? But the, the son says, give me, give me my inheritance. And what did the father do? He gave the son the inheritance. So he went and wasted it on riotous goods and riotous living until he came to an end of himself. And he came back to the father. Did, did the father have any less? No, he was still doing good. Still had servants, still doing well, still had cattle, still had everything that he needed. But Jesus Christ had been appointed heir of all things. Everything belongs to him. He has power. Not only is he the heir of all things, but he's the creator and founder of them too. In other words, Jesus is what? In control. So Christ's uh, accomplishments is the next point. Not only God's approval, but Christ's accomplishments. We see three things there in that uh, third verse. Where it says, "...who being in the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person, and avoiding all things by the word of His power, He had by Himself purged our sins and sat down on the right hand of the Majesty on high." And so we see there's three things being revealed here. Number one, Jesus came to reveal God to us. It says, Who being in the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person, He abode all things by the word of His power. And uh, the idea there, upholding the word, the word of His power, is the idea is that powerful word. You know, my son, he's starting to realize what the son is. 
You know, I, I used to take them out by the window, and every morning we'd sit out there and watch the sun come up. Say, look, watch Elijah. The sun's coming up over the trees. Look, it's in the trees right now. Look, it's over top of the trees. And he's now come to realize what the sun is. And uh, so I'd show him there at the very beginning when, you know, when the sun comes up and when the sun comes down, I take him to the back side of the house. He watches it go down behind the trees. And I would just tell him, hey, the sun's sleeping. It's, co- it's going to come back up on the other side. It's going to be, okay, God keeps everything in perfect working order. But when we're outside now, it seems as we're walking by, once in a while, he'll, he'll, he'll do this number. He'll put his hand over top of his eyes. He s- starts squinting and he says, sun... Son, son, daddy, son, like I can do anything about it. But it shows me he, he understands the sun, the effects that it has upon him, how it's so bright that he can barely see, and he can feel the heat. He knows what the sun is. Now, we understand that the sun is just, it's, everything revolves around the sun, right? But the brightness is not necessarily the sun, but what comes from the sun. That light that we receive, even on a cloudy day like today, I can still see light all around us, even though you can't see the sun. We still know that the sun's there. But that brightness, that heat, that radi- r- radiance that comes from the sun, that, that, that brightness that exudes from it, or however you say it. This is what he's saying here. Uh, you know, that, that, well, let me just give you my, my notes here. God was revealed in the past, but now He has been revealed through Jesus Christ in ways that's much like the radiance of the sun. God's love was expressed, but now He's shown through the life of Jesus. His death, His burial, and His resurrection. It's undeniable, it's overpowering, it's blinding. It's staggering, just like I mentioned with Elijah. Uh, what, what I'm saying is this, you know, you can say I love you to somebody all you want to until you put a ring on a finger and say, I do in front of the whole world, then it's a different story. And God has said, I love you in the past. He loves the whole world. He, he wanted all to be saved. He wanted all of them to come and, and, and to see God. He wanted Israel to be that demonstration of God's power and God's ability but Israel wasn't what they were ought to be. And, you know, they didn't really see it as much back then, but Christ was that demonstration of God's love. Though He spoke in times past, saying, I love you, I love you, I love you, I'll do anything for you, I'll provide for you, I'll take care of you, I've given you a place. I'm talking about Israel here. He's given them a place. But He's shown it specifically in Jesus Christ when He went to the cross and died for every one of the sins. It's essentially putting that ring on the finger and saying, I do before the whole world. I am yours. I don't know any better way to say it, you know. It's this light that the Apostle Paul seen on the road to Damascus, which he was blinded by and struck by so much that he couldn't see. And he says, Who art thou, Lord? He says, I'm Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. And it was that blinding light that once the, the apostle saw... Well, he wasn't the apostle then. He, he was just Saul of Tarsus then. One Saul of Tarsus to Christ, where he became that great apostle. But no man has seen the Father at any time, but the only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him, John 1.18. Not only is Jesus the brightness of His glory, but He's the express image of His person. That express image there is... Uh, in the Greek is the word that we get, we use every day as character. It's that in work of eng- an engraver. It says in the Old Testament where we learn of King Artaxerxes and, and several others who had that, that ring, that, that stamp of the Medes and the Persians, that law that cannot be altered. And whenever he stamped his ring upon something, that seal that he would put within there, that was the image of him that had all of his power, all of his authority Everything was wrapped up in that seal. This is what is going on. Jesus Christ was that express image of His power, of His authority, of His ability. He was the revelation of the Father. 1 Timothy 3.16 says it this way. He says, God was manifest in the flesh. 
the words used of again of a stamping instrument uh, like something you would put uh, like a wax seal or something like that that's the word that's used in our text and then he upholds all things by the word of his power Psalm 33 verse 6 he spake and it was done he commanded and it stood fast and that's power right a leper once came to Jesus one day a leper who's outcasts. Nobody would come around him. Anytime that people would see him, he would have to yell, unclean, unclean, unclean. He seen the Lord one day and he says, Lord, I know that if you will, you can make me clean. And what did Jesus say? I will be thou clean. That word, that upholding all things by the word of his power, that, that, that spoken word was able to change everything for that leper and just the fact that God says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. As soon as I, I put my faith and trust in Him, when I call out unto God to save me, guess what? It's good, it's done. I don't need to do anything else. I know we, be, we, we go into the baptistry because nobody can see what took place within my heart. Nobody can see that day and that hour that I got saved on August 8, 2007. And I finally understood for the very first time, yeah, I mean, no man had to tell me that I was a sinner. I knew that. But for the very first time, I understood that Jesus Christ was the only way to salvation. He wanted to save me. He did save me. He took his, my sins upon Himself, upon the cross, that I might be saved. But on that night there, as I got to alone, and I opened up the Bible, and I remember the Bible being before me there on the bed, and I'm there on my knees, and I'm just crying out unto God, Lord, save me. There was not... Anything that was perceivable necessarily. It wasn't like a light shone in when I got saved. But I tell you, I had the image stamped upon my heart. I knew that something happened. I knew that there was a burden lifted. And when we're baptized, we show the whole world uh, that I'm identifying with the Lord. Now, the waters don't save anybody. It's just a picture of what Christ has done for you. But it doesn't make sense to me to turn away from Christ who's revealed Himself so plainly to us, right? What I'm, what I'm saying here is God has revealed Himself to us in the face of Jesus Christ. These, these believers here are facing persecution. And, and everything is, is... The whole world is turned upside down, if I could say it this way. Just like the, the church in Thessalonica, when, when it seems like everywhere that they turned was persecution. But they had something that, that, that it seems like this church in, in the book of Hebrews didn't have. They had a confidence. They had a stability. They, they were resting through the persecution with their faith and their hope. I mean, if they truly believed in Christ, yeah, they had Him. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that there was something different about the church of Thessalonica when, when they were faced. I mean, from the very beginning, they were faced persecution. The Judaizers tried everything they did to, to, to make their life trouble. But they kept clinging on to Christ. They kept studying, kept working, kept kept going on, though, though, though all the world seemed to be against them. But many are turning like the, these here, the Hebrew believers. Many like them turn back to religion. Turn back to easy Christianity. Turn back to, hey, I just want all my friends to love me and, and feel good about myself. They turn back to those weak and beggarly elements, if I can say it that way. Turn back to vain philosophies. But we need to keep holding true to Christ. He's revealed Himself plainly to you and I, and then Jesus came to reconcile us to God. It says, when He had by Himself purged our sins, that word purge is like you know, when you're spring cleaning. You come home one day and you say, Honey, you know, I had this one thing over here. I had some books sitting over here, and I had a... Uh, s some other things that I liked and they were great and I, you know I'm looking for them right now and they were sitting right here on my end table and honey what happened to them? She said I was doing some spring clean we had to purge some things I got rid of them for you don't worry about it I said the same thing going on here there's some purging the removal of sin of course you know I, and jokes don't always come across do they but uh, 
for, this is a serious matter. He by himself purged our sins, lifted them, taken them away from us, free from guilt, a clean conscience. When he had by himself purged our sins there on the cross. In the Old Testament, that would have been through the sprinkling of blood. But again, Jesus Christ had handled it by Himself. He offered up His body one time for us that we might be saved. And then He rested, didn't He? He sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. You know, there's the Bible says that He ever liveth to make intercession for us, but He's sitting. And only one time did I find that He stands after He sat ascended up into heaven and it's Acts chapter 7 where Stephen looks up and he saw the Lord standing on the right hand of the Father. I like to think that he said, well done, thou good and faithful servant. But he's, there's nothing more for him to do for you and for I. He's already accomplished everything. It is finished, as I said this morning, there on the cross. And so he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. He revealed God to us. He reconciled us to God. It made peace where there was once enmity with our sins, removed it out of the way that we might be reconciled and brought to God because those sins had been taken upon Himself. His righteousness applied to our account there in that substitutionary sacrifice. And then He rested. He's not troubled by what's going on. He rested. He's not looking for other ways to, to rescue us. No, He's resting. But then we move on to an undeniable proof. This is being made so much better than the angels as, by, as he hath by an inheritance to obtain what? A more excellent name than they. A more excellent name than they. Who's he talking about? The angels. It says, for what, uh, verse 5, For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, and let all the angels of God worship him. And the angels, he said, who maketh his angels spirits and the ministers a flame of fire? In other words, and guess who's serving? It's the angels. You know, I don't, you know, I'm glad that you know, there's ministering angels to help us in times of need. Even as we read through the Gospels, we understand at the end of the 40 days of temptation there in the book of Matthew, guess who was there ministering to the needs of Jesus? Angels. When Jesus was there in the Garden of Gethsemane and, and He was in agony in prayer, guess who's strengthening Him? Angels. And after His resurrection, guess who's opening it away to show that the whole world that He's risen from, again from the dead? Angels. There's a purpose for angels. I understand this, but He's much better than the angels, isn't He? He's the one of which all the angels came and adored at His coming here on this earth, the incarnation of Christ, when all the angels are out crying, Glory to God in the highest, peace, goodwill to men. They're praising the Lord God. They're praising Jesus Christ. He has a more excellent name than they. I understand as Peter, as he's going, and, and they've been praying for him. James got executed. Peter got delivered by an angel that came and, and delivered him and set him free. And he's knocking at the door. And Rhoda answers the door. She's so excited. She comes running in. And what do they say? They say, oh, it must be Peter's angel. We're not looking for angels. Like I said, I'm glad that they're there. But Moses wasn't looking for an angel when he's asking, Lord, who will go with me? Well, I'm not going on except you go with me. Abraham wasn't looking for an angel. He was looking for God. He obtained a much better name than a, uh, an excellent name. He's been given a name which is above every name, hasn't he? of whom all the world about before him, whom every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he's Lord to the glory of God the Father. It's a more excellent name than Moses, an excellent name than Melchizedek, a more excellent name than any other thing that's here. Again, I say that 
Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. But the angels, verse 7, they're serving, they're ministering, they're working. What's better? The Lord or angels? You, you, you know what it is. And if you get a hold of God, I mean, you won't want anything else. And that's, that's the whole purpose of my message for tonight. Though things get bad, and they will, though things are tough, and they are, though we don't always understand things, why give in? Why give up? You know, the same God who redeemed us is the same God who's still powerful, who's still able. You know, when things are not all that we want them to be, why stop? I'm just saying it because it's a, a temptation. You, you guys are here, you know. It gets to the point where you, you, you stop, you know, they're no longer meeting together in a building, and then after a while, you know, they start dying off one by one, and next thing you know, you don't see them anymore. And you're brothers and sisters in Christ, you know, what happened? It's a temptation, and it's real. Don't stop. God's given His approval. He's spoken in these last days. He's given His approval on Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. It's not in the world's methods. It's not in the world's ways. It's not uh, seeking some other means of satisfaction. Uh, even in the book of Ecclesiastes, again, I refer back to that because... Solomon says, I've tried everything under the sun and there's no way to be satisfied in this world. No other way to be happy in this world. No other way to live in this world except for to have God as your Savior. You can have all the riches and all the position and all the prestige in the world. You can have all the means of happiness and still be miserable in your life. Why deny Christ when times get hard? Let us hold fast to the Lord. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank You so much for Your Word. I pray that You use it. I pray You use it in my heart and others who are listening in. Lord, watch over us tonight. And I pray You keep us safe throughout the week. Lord, I pray You try our hearts, search us, Lord, and see if there be any wicked way that's there. I thank You that You're so much better than the angels. I thank You that You're so much better than anything that we could have in this world. I say take the world and give me Jesus any day. Lord, we love You. And I pray that You're blessed by the message tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you're not saved today, Jesus Christ is the only way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He wants to save you. He died on the cross for every one of your sins. And all you have to do is understand that He came to die in your place for every one of your sins. And all you have to do is call upon the name of the Lord and He'll save you. If you've been struggling in your faith and in your life, and you've been tempted like I mentioned tonight, and you say, I've I got to tell you, it hasn't been easy, and I feel like giving up. Don't give up. And I pray you seek encouragement in the Scripture tonight. Let this be an encouragement to you. God bless. God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good.